Good evening, everyone. My name is Shiloh Holly. I'm the executive director at the Morris Jamel Mansion. I want to welcome you out on this special evening as we talk about famous furniture, Duncan Fife and the Octagon Room Suite. Uh, so tonight we have two very special guests with us tonight. We have Carswell Rush Berlin, also known as Carly, and uh, conservator Olaf Unisold. Um, we are going to be focusing on the life and work of Duncan Fife through the lens of our octagon room suite, uh, which is a suite of furniture that actually came to us, came to the museum in 1949. Um, Meg, would you mind advancing the slide? Um, and just a few quick tips. This webinar is being recorded. Um, this is a webinar, so you're automatically off camera. Uh, so just take a note. Uh, if you do not want to be uh, here in the event with the recording going on, uh, you can always join us later. This event will be uh, screened on our, uh, posted on our YouTube channel. Um, if you have questions throughout tonight's program, you can either submit a question by using the Q&A function at the bottom or the chat box. Um, and both of those buttons are on the bottom of your screen. So there have been many lives of the Morris Jamel Mansion. We were founded as a museum in 19, 1904, and our period rooms have evolved uh, countless times. So today, you can see a photograph of the octagon room as it currently is. And again, this is part of the original 1765 structure of the building. The suite of furniture that you see here, you see a number of chairs with red upholstery and two pier tables. Uh, these are a part of a suite commissioned by Eliza Jamel, the longest resident of the house, uh, commissioned by uh, Jamel's, uh, by Fife, took a Fife, which was one of the leading cabinet makers at the time. Uh, these pieces, again, have been in our collection since 1949. Uh, they've been upholstered in different uh, upholsteries and different fabrics and have been placed in different rooms throughout the house. But due to our investigation, including having a portrait of Eliza Jamel seated on the, the sofa, uh, which you can see in the next slide, uh, in a painting uh, from the 1820s, we can tell that this suite was actually originally placed in the octagon room. So in our current reinterpretation plan, we have brought this furniture back to the octagon suite from what was formerly the French parlor, and it has be been reupholstered using our, uh, the primary source materials that we have to deduce exactly how this furniture would have looked in its original location. If you are enjoying tonight's program, I would like to encourage you to make a donation. If you text MJM to 44312, and we'll also put a special link in the chat for you to donate, um, you will be entered to win either a behind the scenes tour uh, where you can get up and close uh, to the suites in the octagon room furniture, or if you're joining, joining us from um, the Continental New State, United States or internationally, we'd be happy to do a virtual tour for you. Um, so this is a unique experience for you and up to six guests. We're happy to give you that behind the scenes tour um, where you get to take a look at this furniture up a little bit closely. Um, so anyone again who makes a donation tonight, you can text MJM to 44321. We will, uh, you'll be entered to win um, that very special behind the scenes tour. So without further ado, I want to introduce uh, the first speaker tonight, Carswell Berlin. So Carly Berlin is considered one of the leading dealers in the United States, focusing on classical American classical furniture and period accessories, such as lighting and fireplace equipment. His company, Carly Rich Rush Berlin Incorporated has also handled fine examples of 19th century American painting, silver, glass, brass, cast iron, and French porcelains. He serves on the board of trustee at the Barta Pell Mansion, which is one of our sister historic house trust sites. He's a member of the prestigious National Antiques and Art Dealers Association and the Antique Dealers Association of America. He's a graduate of Kenyon College and he founded his company in 1992 to serve museum and collectors. He's also been designated as a USPAP certified appraiser by Appraisers Association of America. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Carly, who's going to give us a brief overview of the biography of Duncan Fife and walk us through some of his styles. 
Thank you, uh, Shiloh, for inviting me. Can, can, can I be heard now? Is, every, is everyone uh, hearing me? Are, can, you, can I be heard? Can you yep. hear me? Oh, yep. good. Okay. okay. <laughs> Again, thanks, Shiloh. Uh, I, I'm grateful to be here. Uh, the Morris Jumel Mansion, I think, is an invaluable resource, uh, particularly because I live in the neighborhood uh, that has made amazing strides in recent years interpreting the house in a professional and historically accurate way. And I'm flattered to be part of the program, and I'm delighted to share the program with Olaf, uh, who I've known for decades and who's worked with me on several important projects. Uh, and thank everyone for, uh, for being here. I've been given a very short time to illuminate a man whose career spanned 50 years and in that time became the most famous cabinet maker, uh, American cabinet maker in his day and in ours. Uh, tonight I'll give you some basic background and history of the classical period, outline and show examples of six style periods that Fife introduced in New York and discuss uh, how the Morris Jumel suite attributed to him fits into the larger picture. Uh, Having been the subject of two exhibitions at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, you might think there's a great deal of att attention paid to an immigrant cabinet maker whose name is unknown outside the United States and whose legacy is a lot of used furniture, much of which cannot even be positively identified with him, uh, particularly given the disregard of the classical period and much of, the, much of Fife's work shown by furniture scholars of the first half of the, 19th, of the uh, 20th century, uh, uh, who uh, reviewed it uh, very negatively. So this begs the question, why? What's all the fuss about? The answer is simple. Duncan Fife was an exceptional designer throughout his career, a fashion leader, a superb craftsman, and an astute businessman. Fife made furniture in New York City on Fulton Street for fully 50 years, from 1792 to 1847, and his work was as, as impressive in each evolution of style, which is part of his genius. Fife was a native of Scotland and came to America as an adolescent, going first to Albany with his family, but returning to New York shortly thereafter, anxious to begin his career. When he arrived here, he would have been making furniture in the Heppel White style, known in America as Federal. No furniture in this style by Fife has been identified. In fact, the earliest pieces known from his shop date to 15 years after he began in business. What he made in those first 15 years is unknown, but it can be assumed uh, he made furniture in the prevailing English late Georgian taste heavily influenced by the designs of George Heppelwhite, whose cabinet maker and upholsterer's guide was first published in London in 1788. The earliest documented commission for Fife uh, from which furniture survives was made by Will for William Bayard's residence at 6 State Street. There are two invoices from November 1807 and one from 1809. And, and here you can see uh, that furniture as it was displayed at the Metropolitan Museum uh, in 2011. Um, so um, this is what I describe as his second style period. Uh, it's worth noting here that most formal furniture of the early 19th century was inspired by designs published in English, England and France by a succession of designers, none more influential than Sheraton. Uh, you should not think as a result, however, that we were making derivative regional copies of English furniture. In fact, American, English, French, and German cabinet makers were all influenced by Sheraton at the same moment. Sheraton's drawing book style is neoclassical in the manner of the great Scots architect and designer Robert Adam, who brought Roman classicism to England as early as 1760. It's rectilinear, delicate, and symmetrical with decoration of stylized low relief carving or light wood inlay, turned legs, and fluting or reading. It's sometimes called the reeded style. Even in Fife's earliest known work, he was already innovating. Nowhere does Sheraton use car carved scrolled crest rails, as you see here in this sofa. 
yet Fife has cleverly combined French directoire and English styling in these chairs and sofas, a technique he would continue to use successfully for the remainder of his career. Here are a group of New York pieces in the manner of Fife and in the drawing book style and some Fife Sheraton sofas and their crest rail carving to help you identify the type of carving associated with Fife. And these are, uh, the, um, uh, Megan, if you could go, just go back to that last slide for one second. Beautiful. Yeah, I mean, these are, um, I think two of these are from the same, no, all three of these are from different sofas, but I think superior examples of, uh, of three different motifs that, that Fife used over and over again. Okay. Um, uh, Fife uh, begins to transition throughout the first decade of the century, and by the War of 1812, he would largely abandoned the drawing book for the dictionary style and uh, uh, his uh, third style period. And here we see an image from uh, his cabinet dictionary, uh, which was published in 1803, uh, introduced um, to the larger world, the classical style based not on Adam's stylized application of Roman architectural decoration to furniture, but on ancient furniture forms themselves, often called the Grecian style. And I want to draw your attention just to the saber legs of everything in this uh, picture, which is something that is, you know, always uh, associated with Fife. Obviously, he wasn't the only person who did it, but this is a major departure from what we call federal style in the United States. Um, so here we see Clismos chairs. Uh, here, which I think is maybe the most beautiful one I have, I've ever seen. Um, we see curl-based furniture based on Greek and Roman folding seats. Uh, we see uh, triclinium or ancient fulcrum-ended beds designed by the Greeks and used by the Romans to recline while eating. And, uh, um, and here we see uh, tripod tables. Um, oh, wait a minute. We're uh, yeah, tripod tables and Roman lampstand. I think we skipped a slide. Uh, can we go back just a second to, sh oh, somehow we, we seem to have missed the, the, the tripod. Anyway, okay. So, um, uh, and, and here uh, we're introduced to a new vocabulary of ancient design, uh, both anthropomorphic and zoomorphic. Lions heads and feet, like we saw in the last slide, dogs legs, dolphins, swans, this is a piece by Lunwier, of course, not by Fife, uh, eagles, that this is a bed with four eagles, um, lyres and caryatids, we'll see on a chair by Lunwier, uh, both the lyres and the caryatids on the arm supports, uh, Greek keys, acanthus, palm and lotus leaves, anthemians, and more. Uh, the language of the ancient world that had gained new currency after the discovery of the Roman cities of Herculaneum and Pompeii in the second quarter of the 18th century. I refer to this period as late Sheraton. Here are different forms um, of the late Sheraton style. And here's a, just a fabulous sofa and, uh, and I think a, a, a great chair and pier table uh, all uh, believed to be by Fife. At some point after the War of 1812 and before 1818, Fife began to adopt the Empire style, his fourth style period. This is a style developed in Paris by Persier and Fontaine, designers and decorators to Napoleon, who had published their work in a single volume in 1812. This is not a departure, but an evolution of the prior style. The difference is that the former was inspired by classical form uh, intended to invoke the Greek democracy and the Roman Republic. The empire style evoked the Roman Empire and all its concomitant grandeur. It was an expression of empirical ambition rather than revolutionary egalitarianism. The forms are the same, they're just fancied up a bit. Philosophically, this change may have been anathema to early American historians, but you can see for yourself, the furniture is fabulous. Yeah. 
uh, it, by, uh, in 1833 is considered by scholars to be the date at which the next phase of classicism became established in the United States. But Fife was already introducing elements of this new style as early as the mid 1820s. Uh, you just saw a second ago a, 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 um, a broadside that was uh, published by Meeks and Sons uh, with all their latest styles. That one there, yeah. So that's 1833 um, with all those um, restoration styles. This style, his fifth, called Restoration or Greek Plain Style, was the product of the ongoing interest in Greek design augmented by Western sympathy for the Greek War of Independence, circa 1820, and the smoother, less architectonic, more curvilinear style of the French Restoration. Here again, Fife's work leaps from the pack virtually inventing an idiom that no other American cabinet maker could replicate. Deceptively simple, it is the height of sophistication and refinement. Unfortunately, little of the work of Fife's final years is known as the firm attempted to shift away from, the, from classicism into the newly popular Victorian historical revival styles for which they were philosophically ill-equipped. Uh, there's no documented examples of these final years, his sixth style period, but a few likely suspects can be identified by their tight design and superb quality, characteristics that never flagged, early scholars notwithstanding. Now, uh, let's consider the Morris Jumel suite of ebonized and gilt stenciled chairs and sofa, clearly made in his fourth design period, The Empire. Let's begin by acknowledging that this is exceptional and beautiful furniture and very few examples of ebonized and gilt decorated New York furniture exist. But is it Fife? In the absence of firm documentation linking these pieces to Fife, I can say unequivocally that the set of chairs uh, is absolutely in the manner of Duncan Fife and exactly the type of product we might expect Fife to produce for a bespoke customer. Uh, about 1815 to 1820, uh, 1825. The hairy paw legs, which we see here, the acanthus carving at the top of the styles, which we see here, are totally consistent with the documented chairs and ones that we've come to believe were made by Fife. The Christmas of the construction and the decoration of this set are hallmarks of that firm. They also relate strongly to Egyptian style chairs that many experts believe were made by Fife, though there is no proof of connection. And you'll be surprised when you see the next picture because the former picture is this chair that you're looking at now. Uh, so you see how incredibly closely, um, you know, uh, related the, the um, Jumel chairs are to this chair. Um, there's this very interesting group uh, Wendy Cooper has suggested were inspired by an 1823 traveling exhibition in Boston and New York of an Egyptian mummy and accompanying sarcophagus from Thebes, which sparked a mummy mania in America, much as the King Tut exhibition did in the 1980s here. The date of this event would be consistent with the archaeological style of the chairs. And here's another example of that same, not, not, not quite as as exuberant as the former one, but but still pretty great. And and as far as I know, there are only there are only four chairs in this group, um, two like this and two like the the, the other one. Um, the sofa is an interesting case. Stylistically, the sofa could have been made as many as ten years uh, after the chairs were made. It's almost an. A, a, identical illustration of a sofa appears in the broadside by Joseph Meeks and Sons in 1833. There you can see it in the bottom left. Um, and a portrait of Eliza Jumel seated on this couch dates to 1833. It's probably not a coincidence. Uh, and it must be said that this is not in a style that is typically associated with Fife. Doesn't mean it isn't Fife, it just means it isn't typical. Um, it, is in, it is in a style 
with heavy and elaborate carved and gilded brackets that is associated with Meeks and with Holmes and Haynes and Deming and Buckley and Kinnon and Mead and Williams and Dawson, among other New York makers active between 1825 and 1835. This commanding ebonized secretary bookcase at the Metropolitan Museum is thought to be by Meeks or one of the, of the firms just mentioned. They, they, they don't attribute it to Fife. Um, two pieces at the Cleveland Museum of Art bear on this question. This peer table is labeled by Meeks. Uh, yet this superb Grecian couch by an unknown New York maker could be by Fife, I think. Um, additionally, there's another superior ebonized couch or recamier in the collection of the Baltimore Museum, which clearly, uh, with clearly related elements to the Jumel example, which, raises, which rises so far above the norm that's tempting to uh, attribute this to Fife. And, and clearly it's, it's a related thing. So there are many possibilities, and we may never know for sure how this group came into being or who made it. Fife, in my opinion, is a strong possibility. We've looked at six, six evolutions of classical design as interpreted by Duncan Fife and the successor firm Fife and Sons between 1793 and 1845 and explored the roots of these ideas. We examined in depth the details of his style and decoration and, and compared them with Eliza Jumel suite. And it's all been tied neatly in a bow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carly. That was incredibly fascinating. And um, I, I, this may be the first time that we've that we've fit 65 slides of Duncan Fife in in, in about 12 minutes. So congratulations on that. Um, everything was just beautiful, and um, you can really admire the craftsmanship through these photos. Uh, you, um, you know, you know uh, a picture tells a thousand words, and yeah. you know, I think the more pictures you can tell, uh, you can show the the you know the more you can communicate in this stuff. It's yeah. all about what this stuff looks like. Absolutely. And now um, I'd like to introduce our second speaker this evening, uh, Olaf Unasold, who is the owner of Fine Wood Conservation Limited. Uh, and that firm focuses on collections of furniture and wooden objects from the Middle Ages through the present day. The firm prides itself in using materials and techniques that retain the maker's original intent. Olaf has worked in the conservation departments at the Stopp Museum in Munich, Germany, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And he has worked on a number of pieces in our collection, um, I believe since the early 2000s, maybe even before that. Um, so Olaf, would you like to mention a little bit about uh, the conservation process of these particular pieces in our collection. Um, I believe the first time you worked on them was 2005. We have some images up on the screen. Um, you can see that uh, this is a, a different, uh, the upholstery is different and actually the, the environment in which they were presented was also different. Um, so a lot has changed in, in those 15 years. Oh, you're on mute, Olaf. There we go. Hello, Shiloh. Thank you. Hi, Carly. Um, yeah, I think I actually, the first time I looked at these pieces was about 2003. Uh, and then it took a while, I think, until there was some funding to start working on them. Um, it, it's interesting that what Carly was showing before on the, uh, on the sofa as compared to the chairs. They're very different in the, in the materials that were used to achieve the ebonized um, appearance. Uh, in both cases, both the chairs and this, I think we were lucky, or, or Morris Jamel was lucky in that uh, the people who, who had restored and treated them previously ascribed to the um, uh, sort of the, the sheet rock and drop ceiling technique that you find in historic houses. Uh, they didn't remove anything, they actually added on the sofa those uh, gilded cornucopia I remember when I first looked at them, it was just very thick. You couldn't see the details. Um, maybe we can go back to the first slide. And that's something I worked on with, uh, with Giovanni Bucchi, who was the gilding conservator. And he, he was able actually to remove 
um, a gesso that had been applied over and then regilded, and underneath found this beautiful lemon yellow gilding that, for the most part, was intact. And as you can see here with the uh, the feet, a lot of the original was missing, and that's something that Giovanni restored as well. We dealt with the the in this case, these are painted surfaces um, and gilded. They just they needed some cleaning uh, and consolidation of the painted surfaces, especially on the armrests. The, um, both the sofa and the chairs, over time, somebody had treated them, which with what appeared to have been what um, is often referred to also as the winter chair formula. It's a combination of linseed oil and turpentine and vinegar. And the linseed oil that remains behind over time darkens and obscures the contrast between the gilded decoration and um, and the ebonized surfaces, and using uh, using uh, chemicals, we're able to remove the linseed oil and clean the surfaces. Consolidated the flaking painting, uh, painted ebonized surfaces, and um, then pulled it all together with a uh, with a regal res, which is a resin that is soluble in. Um, in mineral spirits so that it can easily be removed without affecting the underlying surfaces. If we can go to the next slide. These are the chairs. Now there's a big difference between the chairs and the sofa in that these were, first of all, they're made out of, out of um, maple, an interesting sort of a curly maple and then they were ebonized using a dye rather than paint. And if we go forward and keep going, let's see where we, uh, yeah, is there, can we go to the next slide, please? Nope, that's, uh, oh, I think a couple of these are missing. Let's go back um, to those chairs. These chairs, um, as you can see in the center, that gives you a sense of what happened. The, the biggest issue with this furniture is that it was exposed to the light. And so UV had caused the staining to fade. Um, and along the gilded areas, we noticed some black lines, which you can not see in these images. But um, it was the curiosity and then realized that the chairs had been ebonized and then gilded and oil gilded and there was remnants of gilding along the edges that you lost the crispness of the detail and this was then painted out with a pigment and over time you would see these pigmented areas much darker than, um, than the, the dyed wood simply because the pigment was not, is much more light fast than the, um, than the dyed surfaces. Aside from that, uh, the other yes, would be, the other aspect of this uh, is that the gilded surfaces had been um, painted over with bronze paint, and again, we were able to remove the bronze paint and revealed in surprising uh, um, uh, detail the original gilding. There were a few areas where there had been some wear and had uh, the underlying um, yellow. Cadmium yellow had uh, was visible, um, but for the most part, the gilding was all there. But somebody decided it was uh, there were just too many blemishes, and they painted over it. Luckily, with um, uh, with bronze paint rather than um, trying to regild the entire elements. Um, so that what you see today, aside from the areas that have been impacted by uh, the Sunlight is pretty much the original surfaces. They chairs were not; they had not broken, had not been abused. There was some loss. The uh, uh, the feet are actually glued up. The right and the left side that was cut out of one board, and then in order to create the pause, there were sections that were glued on. And when we first received these chairs, a couple of those were just missing, so they were recreated. How interesting. Um, so, Olaf, we do have a question. Could you explain a little bit the difference between preservation and conservation? Um, yeah. 
in preservation, what you're trying to do is to is to look at what the maker intended and um, see what's left and keep as much of that original or keep all of the original that you can and just deal with um, uh, deal with the losses and restoration. That's often a very time consuming process. It takes uh, there's time involved in in analysis and also in the treatment. It's much easier to restore a piece and then just to, to paint over it, gild over it, um, refinish it as opposed to trying to unpack the layers and get back to the original finish layer uh, so that a restoration is something that can be done often more quickly and therefore less expensively, but in the process, uh, depending upon what process is used, you often remove and obliterate the original and, in, and also end up losing a lot of those details. I often encounter pieces where somebody decided, oh, let's just sand this and refinish it. And you often, they'll sand through the veneers, you lose the crispness of detail on the edges, you lose the patina, um, and you also will lose any decoration that may have, um, that you may see on the pieces. Yeah, that, that's great. Um, so Duncan Fife uh, has a, a special place in my heart. I grew up in Thomasville, North Carolina, uh, which some of you may know as a contemporary furniture company, uh, country. And um, due to the, the Thomasville furniture industries. Um, so Thomasville is also home to the world's largest Duncan Fife chair, which I believe is 30 feet tall. It's our town's kind of iconic landmark and, and logo. It's used for everything. Um, so could you speak a little bit about uh, the proliferation of replicas that of, of five pieces that happened in the earliest 20th century and how one may identify an original versus a replica? Um, are you asking me or Carly? <laughs> Uh, open okay. it. Open it up to both of you. Okay, go, go ahead, Olaf. I'll, I'll I'll go afterwards. I mean, one certainly the quality of the of the woods. Uh, you can look at at the finished materials. Um, if it's veneered, you can look at the thickness of the veneer. Twentieth uh, century pieces. You'll often you'll find that the veneers are knife cut as opposed to sawn, and so they're much thinner. And that that transition is really around around the turn of the of the turn of the century. Um, you will find the joinery will be in uh, reproductions will often be with dowels rather than mortise and tenon. Um, carvings will definitely, in many cases, they'll have been done mechanically, so you lose a lot of that detail. Uh, and then if you can look at the finishes uh, under UV light, you can get a sense of, are you dealing with original finish that's a natural resin or with more, more modern finishes? Yeah, I, I think that pretty much sums it up. I mean, I, I, I looked, you know, there, there are two things that you want to, that I want to establish when I'm looking at an antique. I want to, I want to be sure that it's old. Yeah, I mean, like, I don't mean old, like, like 10 years old, I mean, 200 years old. Uh, and I want to make sure I, I want it to be American because I'm a dealer of American furniture. So those are the things that are of the first concern that I have. Um, most of those things I can tell at a distance, uh, but if there's a question, you know, I want to look at the construction. Uh, I want to look for, uh, for mortise and tenons construction. I want to look at the quality of the dovetailing um, on drawers and, and uh, you know, and, and major pieces. Uh, and I want to look for oxidation of the wood. I, um, and I mean, those are the, those are the things that uh, you look at automatically. Um, and then, and then, uh, frankly, you know, if you do this long enough, you, you know, at a, at a distance, you, you don't have to get all that close. You don't have to crawl underneath most of the stuff to know it just, you, 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 I guess you just get a sense after you look at so many of these things. Uh, it just looks like a like the real thing, or it doesn't. Um, but those things can be confirmed in a technical way, uh, you know, by looking closely. 
uh, but uh, but it's it's not that hard to tell you know a reproduction or a fake from from the real thing. Fakes are trickier just because you know somebody's trying to fool you. Um, but reproductions, there's no you know there's there's no uh, a way that a reproduction looks like a period piece. They're, they're not they're not uh, hard to confuse. Um, I just wanted to add that uh, certainly one of the other things that I forgot to mention is looking and looking underneath and areas that are not finished to see if you can see any um, signs of the type of tools that were used to cut the wood, uh, whether you know it's hand planed or whether you see um, saw marks from a circular saw. The other thing is the quality of the wood. The, the, the woods that were used, whether veneer or solid in the early, um, early 19th century, were often just from virgin forests. They were some of the first trees that uh, were cut in the areas that they came from. Compared to what uh, people were using in the uh, 100 years later, you often, you no longer had the quality of wood. So you can't find the kind of mahogany uh, and, and crotch veneer and, and other types of, of woods that you, um, that you would have found 100 years earlier. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, but that's, that's part of the feel of the piece. You, you know, you, again, you can, you, you can look at a piece from a distance and see the, those quality differences. I think, you know, you don't have to get in there with a, a micrometer or something and measure the thickness of the veneer. It's, it's, it's obviously, you know, a, a something of substance uh, rather than sort of paper thin. So we have a few uh, different questions regarding materials and uh, stylistic characteristics of Fife furniture. The first comes from Anthony. Uh, so he would uh, love for one of you to talk about uh, and address the almost omnipresence of mahogany in these pieces or otherwise extremely dark finishes as opposed to the light birches and satin woods of contemporary Biedermeyer furniture in England. I'm sorry, Jerry. Right. Well, uh, uh, I think Olaf knows a lot about this. What I know about it is that that uh, uh, much, probably all the mahogany that was used here uh, in you know in the United States 200 years ago uh, came from the Caribbean. It came from uh, Honduras and the Yucatan Peninsula and Cuba and the island of Hispaniola. Um, and uh, and it came you know right right up the coast from the Caribbean, and it was it had been the wood of choice um, in the Chippendale period, uh, and in the Federal period, and ultimately in the Classical period. Uh, though at the very end of the Classical period, they started to transition into rosewood for the fancier pieces. You do occasionally see maple and satinwood pieces, but they but they're rare. Um, as to why they used uh, lighter woods in uh, in Europe, I, I I don't know the answer to that. There there was an issue. It was it was a question of cost and availability, and um, because simply um, in northern Europe, it was very difficult to to actually acquire mahogany, uh, and if they could, it was very expensive. One of the things that I've seen a lot is where they would take either walnut and make it look like mahogany, or they would take birch and then stain it to, um, to give it a mahogany uh, appearance. That's, that's great. Um, so uh, still regarding uh, some of the details of the furniture, Verdery asks that some of the animal poffy are shaped with such a such a sharp angle that it seems like they would crack when the furniture was set on. Is the wood that strong or are there construction tricks to make the pieces sturdy? Uh, um, Olaf, why, why don't you handle that? You're, or, I mean, I, it's generally, it, it depends on the, the, the wood. Uh, these five chairs are made of maple, which is extremely hard and holds an edge very well. Um, much better than say something out of uh, made out of out of walnut, um, but most of the woods that are were were used can have tremendous strength and can hold an edge quite well without uh, without you know as long as they're not abused and just used uh, normally. Uh, 
Um, uh, let me jump in just for a second and say that that mahogany is fairly hardwood. It's not as hard as maple, uh, but but it, it's a pretty strong wood. And um, and uh, but but one of the problems uh, with ch with these Klismos chairs, uh, uh, maybe not your set, maybe not this set because it's made of maple, but all the ones that are made of mahogany. Um, you do you do find breaks and repairs uh, because frankly uh, because of the curve of the of the leg, it the, the it's beautiful but it isn't it isn't that um, uh, they they sacrificed um, strength uh, because of the design and as a result you often see broken legs in in mahogany Klismos chairs. Uh, so, uh, so there is a problem there uh, with with mahogany. Yeah, it, it just if you if you push your design too far and you take a board and you cut it and you end up with with what's called short grain. So you can imagine a board and you're trying to cut a curve out of that. You get to the point where you just don't have the grain going all the way through from the from the bottom to the top, and that then becomes much more liable to uh, to splitting or breaking off. There is also certainly there's a tremendous difference in the mahogany of that period versus today. You pick up mahogany from that period. Often that was cut not not in the not in the in the jungle, but closer to um, uh, to the shoreline in a drier environment, and it's just much more dense and hard than um, than the kind of mahogany that that you can find today, even it, even if it is traditional Switinia uh, mahogany. Yeah, I think that's that's a good point, Olaf. Uh, there is an author named Jennifer Anderson who just wrote a book about mahogany, and it's more of a social history of of looking at the, looking at the material through the lens of decorative arts. And you know, Fife is mentioned in a few different chapters, um, but the subtitle is "The Cost of Luxury Goods in Early America," and it's really taking a look at um, you know the deforestation station of the mahogany trees, the slave trade, and how the pieces of wood actually arrived um, here mm -hmm. stateside. And one thing of note is that Fife's son actually ran a lumber mill uh, in the later years of, of Duncan, mm -hmm. Duncan Fife's um, cabinet making, uh, which I, I find incredibly interesting. And we'll, uh, we'll put a link to that book in, in the chat shortly. Um, but let's move on to our next question, which comes from, um, there are a few questions about uh, Carly, what Carly has identified as, as five styles and phases. Are there qualities and characteristics that span his whole career or do these, the styles that you identify, um, is there something that, that can be identified that separates each particular uh, style? Oh, well, let me start by saying that that the style periods that I've identified are ones that that I believe in. In other words, uh, I, I didn't read that in a book. Uh, that, that those are those are delineations that that I have made, um, and um, so so I, I just want to make that clear. Um, and uh, with regard to uh, tr things that I see from one style to the next is that that Fife had, I, I think, you know, an amazing sense of style. I mean, he was a he was a wonderful furniture designer. Uh, obviously, he like everyone else was working from pattern books that were published in London and published in Paris, uh, but but really nobody. Uh, was bringing the just because you see it in a pattern book doesn't mean that you can realize it in real life. Um, he could he could realize it and move beyond the pattern book design into a realm that was his own. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll never forget this is a, a quick anecdote. I don't want to take up the whole night, but uh, I brought. I don't even remember in my presentation that Klismos chair, the first one I showed with the curl uh, shape in the back and the hairy paw legs, I said was the most beautiful I had ever seen. Uh, I had a set of six of them 
and it was, uh, and I took them to the International Fine Art and Antique Dealer Show. I was the only American furniture dealer in that show, which was in New York, but it was all filled with English and French and Spanish and German uh, uh, antique dealers. And I'm telling you that everybody came around and looked at those five chairs. All those dealers, like 75 dealers, they all like walked by. And I said, yeah, that's why they called them Duncan Fife, pal because he was great. There you go. He was great. And, and, you know, you can look at a picture, you know, a, a design picture and, uh, and not come up with this chair. Um, this is, you know, this is something special. It's the proportions. It's, it's the, um, it's the, um, the balance of it. It's the spareness of it. Uh, it, it's everything about it. It's just, uh, and, and he brought that to every style as he went along. And that's what's so amazing uh, that he could, that he could transition from one style into the next and not lose the edge, you know, not lose that, that sense of a sense of fashion and sense of, of proportion and sense of style. And, and I can tell you that in the later period, uh, in that restauration period, uh, most of the cabinet makers in America fell down around that style. They, they just couldn't do it. Corvell couldn't do it. Barry couldn't do it. You know, no, Fife was the only one who in that style could, could, could produce some of the best material of his entire career. Nobody else could do it. And, and that's, that's remarkable. That's sort of furniture genius. That's the name of your next book, Carly, yeah, Furniture I, I, genius. I, I hope that's responsive to the question. I'm, not sure. <laughs> um, I'm going to ask a few more. We are running a bit short on time. Um, Michael asks, is there any work currently be, being done right now to just attribute New York Hefeweife pieces to Fife, and were there other great makers uh, in New York City working during that period? Uh, for me? Yes. Well, I, I don't know if anybody is specifically working on that, on that issue. Uh, you know, obviously Peter Kenny, uh, who was the curator of the, of the um, exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum, you, you know, probably knows as much about that as anyone. And, uh, and at least in 2011, there was no, you know, there was no uh, documentation of anything from that period. It's, it's just sort of a blank. I mean, there are a number of pieces that, that you can look at and say, well, that's, you know, that's certainly the quality or the caliber that Fife might have made, and it might be by him, but there's no, there's nothing to, to actually link it to Fife. Um, like like the chair that I showed, the the Heppel White chair that I showed is, you know, could very well be by Fife, but it it simply can't be proved. Um, so that's all I can say say about that. Uh, um, uh, it's amazing that a guy who worked for fifty years and who was successful, um, that there are so few labeled pieces by that. I think there are fewer than ten pieces. Would, would they actually have Fife's label on them? You must, there must be thousands and thousands of pieces of Fife furniture out in the world. Uh, and they're 10 with his label. And Carly, would that just be like a maker mark stamp or like when you say label, is that his name? Uh, yeah, he m mostly used a paper label. Uh, most of the, most of the um, documented pieces are labeled with a, with a paper label. Obviously there are some that uh, that came down in families and the and the invoices still exist and there are some for which there are bills of lading um, to the family and they 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 remained in the family so we know what they are um, so there is a body of work that that can be linked to him you know without question but considering how many pieces he made uh, or came out of that shop uh, relative to the pieces that can be uh, you know with hard evidence. You know, it's, it's a tiny fraction. Yeah. 
And Eric has an in interesting observation. Um, so he notes that Duncan Fife is, has a mausoleum in Greenwood Cemetery. And he's always wondered if he's in a mahogany casket with a carved leg stand. Um, and just something interesting that I just recently learned is that uh, Duncan Fife actually made coffins for wealthy New Yorkers during a period of time too. Um, so that's you know something that you can add into your book called uh, Furniture Genius, Carly. You know, um, when they opened the Erie Canal in 1825, um, as part of the celebration, they 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 brought um, big uh, big uh, casks, uh, bottles of water from Lake Erie all the way down the canal, and they emptied that water into New York Bay. And those bo big bottles of water from Erie Canal were in were in uh, were in crates, uh, mahogany crates that were made by Duncan Fife. Um, he he made coffins. Uh, <clears throat> he made uh, you know ready to wear furniture that you could walk into his shop and buy. He m made the most elaborate bespoke things, um, like some of the pieces that I showed. Uh, he he would he would come or he would send one of his men over to your house to fix a latch on one of your cabinets if it was broken. Uh, and and if you look in in the Mets book, the first. Uh, the first invoice from Fife that is known, dating to, 19, to 1800, um, I own. And, uh, and there's a whole laundry list of little chores like that that he did for customers, fixing the latch on the cabinet. So yeah, he did everything from soup to nuts. Um, Olaf, here's a question that you may be able to answer. Um, this comes from John. Were woods used for furniture in the 19th century aged for as much as 20 years before using? Um, I don't think 20 years would have been, it just doesn't, it doesn't make sense from a business standpoint. You're, you're putting a lot of money into cutting the woods, bringing them up. And once they get here and get cut in the mills, you'd have the boards and you would air dry them. And that would, that could be, depending upon the type of wood, um, uh, a year, a couple of years, but certainly not 20 years, because there's just too much, too much money that's been sunk into this for it to stay around that long. Of course, there are boards that will be, um, you know, that you just don't get to. And, and it's great if you've, if you've allowed it to sit around for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, and I think the furniture conservators I know and the cabinet makers I know, they always have these, you know, they're always looking for wood and they're storing it somewhere and they're holding on to it, thinking I'll find a project that I can use it for. Um, I have a, a colleague in, um, in the Netherlands who has a lot of um, uh, mahogany boards that he acquired over the years. Unfortunately, he doesn't have them, he doesn't have documentation for them. So he literally built a, a, um, a false wall and stored them behind it because he doesn't want to have them taken by, uh, um, by the, the authorities because he doesn't have proof of when, of when the wood came into the country. Um, and I, myself, we worked on a Lanuay piece once where I contacted uh, a sawmill in, um, in Europe, in Germany, looking for uh, a nice large piece of mahogany for a Lanuay pier table with figure in it. Um, and couldn't find anything. And once he called me, somebody came in with a board that uh, we're going to cut up. And this was all. They had an old, um, an old mill that they rescued from East Germany that they would then saw the boards in the way they were done in the 19th century. So I was able to purchase a piece wow. of this sawn veneer. Uh, one thin piece of sawn, well, you know, it was three, four millimeters, uh, was over $1,000. But um, I was very, very lucky to have that. Uh, uh, in, um, in Paige Talbot's book on, on uh, Savannah, furniture. Um, she, she quotes letters from, from customers of, uh, of a firm in Philadelphia called Cook and Parkin, uh, where, where the customers are specifically asking for pieces where the wood has been sufficiently aged so it's not going to warp, you know, like the last stuff that they sent uh, that warped and now, now they can't close the, the, the door on the armoire anymore because 
the doors warped and you need to, they need a new latch. And so, I mean, this is the kind of stuff that was of concern to customers in the period that, that, uh, that the wood was sufficiently well aged and they, they brought it up. I mean, they were, they were savvy customers. They knew about woods warping and they didn't want that. And, uh, and they wanted to make sure their cabinet maker wasn't going to give them, uh, you know, wood that hadn't been sufficiently aged. Um, so we just have time for two more quick questions. Um, so I have one question about uh, five furniture and private collections, and then a few questions about um, other historic house museums in New York City with five collections. Um, so the first question, how much five furniture is out there not in public collections? Uh, I, I think a fair amount. I mean, as I said before, uh, there's a lot of stuff that that we don't know is Fife. I mean, it could be Fife and it could not be Fife. It, it, it's, it's the kind of furniture, there were, there were um, uh, hundreds if not thousands of cabinet makers in New York City in, in 1810, 1820. Uh, Fife had lots of competition and, and all the cabinet makers in New York were kind of making the same thing at the same time. And all the cabinet makers in Philadelphia were kind of making stuff that looked like Philadelphia because that's what they saw. That's what the customers saw. They saw it in their friend's house. They went and they said, Oh, well, you know, gosh, I saw that table at Mrs. Smith's and I want a table just like that. Uh, and so they went to their cabinet maker in Philadelphia uh, uh, where Mrs. Smith had gotten her table and they got one like that. So, so that's why, you know, uh, furniture from New York looks like, looks all a little bit alike and all the furniture in Philadelphia looks a little bit alike and the Boston furniture looks like that. Um, uh, so there is commonality um, there, uh, but but um, you know Fife made a lot of furniture that was sort of off the rack furniture. It was perfectly good, uh, but it 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 wasn't uh, it wasn't his bespoke line. And I think there's probably a lot of that out there that um, that's not really identified, and there's no real way of identifying it specifically. So the last question comes from Beth, and fortunately we have um, Anthony who is with us tonight who may be an expert on this as well. Uh, but Beth is asking, she knows that the Merchant's House Museum has several pieces by Fife in their family living room. How did those pieces, if you're familiar, Carly, compare to the pieces at the mansion? And I also know that Bartow Pell also has some Fife pieces. So could you largely speak about Fife and other uh, collections of New York City historic houses? Yeah, well, the Merchant House is, of course, a wonderful place, and I encourage everyone to go. Uh, their chairs are later than your chairs. They, they, they are in that sort of that uh, fifth period of Fife, that um, restauration or plain style um, and I think they're, they're very nice chairs. Again, I, I don't know what kind of documentation they have linking them to Fife. Again, Fife was not the only person making chairs like that in New York uh, in the period. They, they certainly could be by Fife. I just don't, I just, I'm just not sure um, that, that they are documented to Fife. That's all I'm saying. Uh, but they're, they're, they're nice chairs. They're probably um, 10 to 15 years after your chairs were made. So, um, uh, but certainly worth seeing. And uh, the chairs at, at Bartow Pell, um, there are, uh, there are quite a few chairs at Bartow Pell. The, the, the very best ones, I, I believe we have a pair of chairs with liar backs um, of, of this, of, of this period, sort of 1815 to 1820 period, uh, with beautiful um, saber legs with acanthus carving on the front that become, that, that, uh, uh, I think our chairs have Harry Paul legs. They're, they're superb, superb chairs in old surface. Um, you know, almost worth a visit just to see them. We have other Fife furniture uh, at Bartow Pell as well. There's a, there's a, a, a wonderful box sofa um, by Fife. 
Um, there is a there is a bed, uh, a four poster bed, I believe, by Fife that has a very strong provenance from families that bought furniture from Fife, and and also parenthetically, we have a bed uh, uh, labeled by Charles Honoré Lanouillet. Great, and uh, we also had a note from Eric that said that Gracie Mansion also has some five pieces. Um, so Anthony from uh, Merchant's House, would you like to add anything about um, Fife and other historic house trust properties in, in New York City since you're a trustee or a board member at Merchant's House? Yeah, hi Shiloh, thanks so much for inviting me to speak and hi Carly, it's nice for our paths to cross. Hi. Uh, I just wanted to jump in and confirm um, pretty much all the commentary I heard tonight. The Merchant's House collection is a little later, as Carly said, than your collection. The family moved into the Merchant's House on East 4th Street in 1835, and clearly there was a large campaign of furniture purchasing when they moved from a significantly smaller house near um, St. Uh, St. Paul's to uh, the Merchant's House uh, in the Bond Street area. The chairs in question are, are not documented. None of the furniture in the house is documented and we don't have any of the family's uh, receipts. But uh, stylistically, we've been told repeatedly by uh, experts along the lines of Carly's uh, um, expertise that stylistically, they're pretty much unquestionably Fife. And I just want to jump in and say that uh, we're actually preparing a presentation for the end of this month on the architecture in the house and one on furniture in November. And so I've been crawling under all the furniture in the museum preparing these uh, video presentations. And the chairs are just stunning. The workmanship is extremely outstanding and does compare to other pieces I've seen uh, in museum collections and other historic houses that have allowed me to get up close and, and personal with them. Uh, and um, it's interesting to be comparing the various pieces of furniture, all of them from top shops uh, and seeing the differences in more design quality than anything else. And that's, uh, as Carly was uh, saying, is really where Fife is outstanding. There is a finesse and a subtlety to his uh, design, which is then carried out in superb craftsmanship that just really takes his furniture to the top of the heap, quite honestly. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Anthony, for sharing that. Um, so our, unfortunately, our evening together is drawing to a close. Um, I do want to remind you, if you're, if you enjoy tonight's program, to please make a donation to the Morris Schmel Mansion. Uh, if you do that by this evening, you'll be entered to win a very special um, behind the scenes tour. You can donate by texting MJM to 44312 or uh, click the link in the chat, morrisjamel.org backslash donate. Um, we have a few great programs coming up. We have started uh, bringing some on-site uh, exterior events to you, including our family days, uh, which will hopefully be back on site in, um, and remain on site in October. Um, and our Handwriting the Constitution event, uh, which we are also partnering with other Historic House Trust properties, that last session is tomorrow. Um, and then Anthony, of course, mentioned some great uh, programming at Merchant's House, uh, and I'm sure that other museums such as Bartow Pell and Gracie, who have five collections, are doing more decorative arts programming, so make sure you check those out as well. Um, for those of you who had a few questions uh, that didn't get answered tonight, we will um, do a little bit of research and add some notes in our additional resources page, which is available on our website. Uh, tomorrow you'll get an email uh, asking you to fill out a survey about tonight's program with that link where you can learn more about Duncan Fife and a few of the things that we have talked about tonight. Again, thanks so much for joining us. I want to thank Carly and Olaf uh, and everyone else who made this program possible. Uh, it was a lovely evening talking about uh, Furniture Genius. Thank you.